Hello everyone, welcome back. So, so today's video, we are going to be dealing mainly with problems of mechanics, you know, and I picked most of these questions are from AITS and these questions are mostly on the easier side. Okay. So, uh, I want you guys to, you know, comment down below. What exactly do you guys want me to upload? So I'm planning on, you know, keeping on uploading the AITS stuff and maybe some Pathfinder stuff. If you guys want me to upload something else, I can upload that as well. Just comment down below. Okay. Okay, so let's begin with the first question. So this is so this question is from projectile motion. So the question, so we have a ball whose mass is m and it is projected from a point p, okay, on the ground as shown in the figure. Uh, it hits a vertical wall at a distance of l from it. Okay, so the point of projection is at a distance of l from the wall. So option A is saying that the ball will return to the point p. So all the options are you know talking about uh, what is the condition under which the ball after hitting the wall will come back to the initial point. Okay, so that's what uh, we have to figure out. So, and no information about the collision is given. Okay, so first let's draw a diagram. So first let's talk about the case when L uh, equals R by two. So which you know essentially means that uh, if there was no um, wall in between, the trajectory of the particle would have looked something like this. Okay, where the wall intersects uh, at the point of maximum height. Okay, so this distance is R by two. Now guys, what happens uh, at the topmost point, the velocity vector is horizontal, right? And its magnitude is just u cos theta if the angle of projection is theta. Now we know if the collision is elastic, then what happens is uh, as the impulse is perpendicular to the wall, okay, the velocity u cos theta uh, after collision will just get reversed, right? So the velocity just gets reversed and it will follow back along the same trajectory and it will hit the initial point. Okay, so if L equals R by 2 and the collision is also elastic, then we can conclusively say that the point, the ball will return to the initial point P. So if you observe the, now option A is saying that the ball will return to the point P if L is half the horizontal range. But here they didn't mention anything about the coefficient of restitution, right? So option A, we'll have to say it's wrong because it's a general statement because uh, we can just observe, right? If the collision was not elastic, then the rebound velocity will become E times U cos theta, right? So if it is E times U cos theta, uh, which basically means the horizontal velocity has decreased, which means it won't reach the initial point. It will fall somewhere in front of the initial point. So the trajectory in, the, in that case would look something like this. Okay, and it'll hit this X point. L equals R by 2 is not enough condition, right? We will need E equals to 1 as well. So option A is clearly wrong. So now let's talk about case 2 when L is less than capital R by 2. So this would mean, so if there was no wall, the projectile would have looked something like this. Okay, so this is our distance L now. So, okay, so what do we do in this case? So here guys, first let's just assume that the collision is elastic. Okay, so first we are going to, so we are going to work with the assumption that E equals 1. Okay, and the reason for doing this is that if we assume E equal to 1, we can follow the laws of reflection here because the velocity vector after hitting the wall, right, it rebounds in such a way that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection is the same, right? So this kind of follows the laws of reflection, but only if E equals 1. So let's say if this is the point P, then its mirror image, take considering this as the mirror, uh, on the other side will be somewhere over here something like this okay so as the particle moves along this trajectory its mirror image moves along this trajectory okay so till the particle hits the wall it will move like this and after that it will move along this particular trajectory okay so the trajectory will look something like this now okay so now here clearly we can see that the particle after hitting the wall it lands somewhere behind the point p but this is assuming that e was equal to one okay if E is less than 1, then, you know, by previous discussion, we know that after hitting the wall, it wouldn't have enough horizontal velocity to cover a large distance. So it will come fall somewhere closer to P. So, um, so we can kind of get a feel that if we keep on reducing E, then the only difference is that the horizontal velocity will decrease. Then basically what will happen is the particle won't be able to go this far, but in fact, it will fall somewhere over here. So we can clearly get a feel that for a certain value of the coefficient of restitution, the particle after striking the wall will come and fall at point B. Okay. So there is a cert so there is clearly a certain value of E for which the particle after striking the wall comes back 
comes and falls back to B. So here, so if you observe the option B, it says the ball will return to point P if L is less than or equal to half the range. So even this would be wrong. Okay, and the reason is in the exact detail. So they're saying the ball will return, which means it will definitely return if L is less than or equal to R by 2. That's not true. But it can return, okay, in, in a certain situation for some value of coefficient of restitution E, after striking the ball, it can return to the point P, okay? So, so yeah, that was a discussion for L less than R by 2. So now let's talk about what happens if L is greater than R by 2, okay? So B option uh, would be wrong. Uh, now if you check D, now D option is also kind of related. So D option says that it will return if collision is elastic and L is less than R by 2. So the which is clearly wrong, right? If uh, then it will fall at a point which is much behind the point P. So um, option D is clearly wrong. So now let's talk about option C. So finally, the case three corresponds to uh, L greater than capital R by two. So in this case, uh, again, we'll do the, do the same trick. So we'll consider, we'll draw the image of point P with respect to the mirror. So I am gonna dot this line so that it looks like the mirror image, okay? So there's going to be P dash, okay? So here, what will happen is after it hits the wall, uh, it will follow this trajectory. So here the trajectory followed will be this particular trajectory. Okay. And here, and again, this is the E equal to one case. The op geometrical optics rule can only be used if E equals one. So, so now, um, so here we can clearly see that the particle finally falls at a distance to the right of P. So, so in the elastic case, it clearly doesn't come back. Okay. But he, here, even if you assume the case, which is not elastic, uh, what, the traject after hitting the wall, the trajectory is going to look something like this, right? Uh, if we assume a coefficient of restitution, the horizontal velocity here will be decreased even more, which means it won't be able to cover this distance, right? It'll fall somewhere in front. So in this case, clearly the particle won't reach P. So the closest it will get to the point P is the elastic case, okay? Uh, in all the other cases, it will be further away, okay? So, so yeah, that was problem number one. The the answer will be option C, which states the ball cannot return to the initial point if L is greater than half the horizontal range. Okay. So now let's move to the second question. So this is problem number two. So, so the problem says we have a string as shown in the figure, which passes over a smooth pulley. Okay. So this is the pulley that they're talking about. And the pulley is rigidly attached to the trolley A. Um, if speed of trolley is constant and is equal to VA, the speed and magnitude of acceleration of block B at the instant shown. So, so we just have to find the speed and the acceleration of this block B uh, at this particular instant. Okay. Okay. So first, okay. So first let's uh, draw a diagram. So instead of drawing the entire cart, I'm just drawing the pulley A. Okay. So, so this is the ground level. So, and let's say this is the wall. So now here as the pulley is rigidly attached to the trolley, it will move in the x direction with a speed of VA. Okay. So here, what we can do is uh, draw the picture of the situation after a very small interval of time. Okay. So let's say, so let's say this is the situation at t equal to zero and we want to draw the situation after t equals dt. So after some time dt, the pulley would have forward, um, the pulley would have moved forward by some distance. So for the sake of clarity, uh, I'm going to displace it by a pretty large amount. Okay. You know, and the threads are going to be different now. So the upper thread would look something like this. Okay. Basically its length would have decreased. Okay. And as the length uh, of this part is decreased, the block B would have went downwards. So this is the situation after DT seconds. Okay. Now the reason I did it is because the velocity of block B is nothing but the change in position in DT seconds, right? So if, so if I can figure out how much the block B went downwards, that's basically the velocity. Okay. So, <clears throat> so this is situation at T equal to DT seconds. So here we are going to uh, make use of geometry a little bit. So, so let's call this as P1 and the final position of the pulley as P2. So the distance, so I'm going to draw it over here now. So the distance P1, P2 uh, is nothing but the velocity of the pulley multiplied by the time, right? And the velocity of the pulley is given to be VA. So this is going to be VA dt. 
So now if I drop a perpendicular from this line to the upper string, okay, and let's call this as point P3. Okay, so we can approximately say that P3O and P2O are equal in length. Okay, okay. So this additional length over here, uh, which is basically P3, P1, is the length by which B went downwards. Okay, so, so all we have to do is determine this length P3, P1. So let's complete the triangle over here. So this is 90 degree, this is P3. So the length, so the length P3, P1 is nothing but so this angle was theta. So this would be VA cos theta DT. Okay. So, so B basically dropped down by a distance of VA cos theta DT. So the change in the position of B turns out to be VA cos theta DT. So this just means DYB by DT is VA cos theta. And the side length of this triangle is given. So the so the base of the triangle is 3 and the height is 4. So cos theta is going to be 3 by 5. So at this particular instant, the velocity of block B is going to be 3 by 5 VA. Okay, so that would be option C. So a quicker way to do it is clearly by the method of virtual work. So if you want to use that, it will be... So basically all you have to do is sigma t dot V equal to 0. The velocity of block A is in, in the rightward direction. So it will be, so here the t dot v will be t cos theta multiplied by va, right? For the trolley, it will be t cos theta into va. And uh, for the block, it will be t into vb. So if you equate these two, uh, you'll just get vb equals va cos theta. It's the same thing, okay? Okay, so now for acceleration, we can uh, just differentiate the velocity. So the velocity of b is va cos theta. So the acceleration of B is going to be, now here VA is a constant, so we don't have to differentiate that. Uh, but theta is a variable, so we'll have to differentiate it. So it'll be minus sine theta d theta by dt. And uh, in order to determine d theta by dt, uh, we can again go back to the old diagram that we just drew. So here this angle, uh, this particular angle, so here this angle is theta, and this particular angle over here, uh, is a small change in angle theta. So we'll call it as d theta. Okay. Now, as I said earlier, um, it's length over here, p2, p3, it's extremely small. So we can use the um, arc length formula here. So for a second, uh, let's say this length is L. So the length p2, p3, which we can also figure out from this triangle, it will be Va sine theta dt. Uh, it is also equal to the radius, which is L, multiplied by the angle d theta. So we can say L d theta would be equal to V a sine theta dt. So I'm just uh, equating the lengths in two different ways. Okay. So from here, we'll get uh, d theta by dt as V a sine theta divided by L. So now you can just substitute it back over here. So you'll get the acceleration of B as minus V a uh, minus V a squared sine squared theta divided by L. So let's substitute everything. So 16 over 125 va squared okay so that would be option d so yeah that was the discussion for this question now we can move on to the next one so okay so this is problem number three so here we have a particle whose mass is m uh, given an initial velocity v naught tangent to the horizontal rim of a smooth cone at a radius of r naught from the vertical direction from the vertical center line as shown at point a so its velocity is given along the horizontal rim okay okay and its initial distance from uh, the center of this horizontal circle is r naught okay so now the particle will start sliding along the cone and uh, it's given that as it slides to a point b the vertical distance h below a so b is at a distance of h from this horizontal level okay so basically this distance over here is given to be h from the vertical line the point b is at a distance of small r okay now it's given that it's velocity v so at this point the velocity is v and it makes an angle of theta with the horizontal tangent to the cone through b so basically if you draw a horizontal plane that cuts the cone at this particular point at b then the velocity vector will make an angle theta with it so now we have to figure out the value of theta speed at b um, and this question is slightly different okay so anyways let's get into the discussion okay so first let's draw a simple diagram so initially uh, a was somewhere over here 
So now in order to visualize the velocity of B, what I'm going to do, do is, is draw a yellow line connecting the point B and I'm going to draw only the yellow line over here. Okay. Okay. So at this instant, let's say the point uh, B is somewhere over here. Now, okay. So here the velocity. Okay. So let's say this is the horizontal plane. The velocity of B is uh, given as V here, making an angle of theta. So its velocity in the horizontal plane is going to be V cos theta. Okay. Which means from the second diagram, the V cos theta is going to be into the plane. So if you just uh, for a second want to visualize V cos theta is the velocity. Uh, v cos theta is the velocity with which uh, the point B moves around a horizontal circle. Okay. And then it will also have a V sine theta, uh, which, which is not vertical, but along the incline. Okay. So the V sine theta. So the second velocity component is going to be V sine theta, which will be along the incline. Now, why is it along the incline? Because the particle cannot have uh, a normal component of velocity. If there are two particles, uh, two objects that are in contact, the velocity along common normal must be the same. So this is not moving, which means the particle cannot have a velocity in the normal direction. Okay. So it has two components. One is V cos theta into the plane and one is V sin theta along the incline. Okay. So now let's solve the easiest question, which is basically uh, question number two, uh, which wants us to find the speed of the particle. So this is just a question of based on energy conservation. So the, so the particle dropped down by a height of H, right? Let's try to draw the force diagram of the particle at this particular location. So let's say this is the point B. So the only two forces acting on this body are, is the gravity, the normal reaction from the surface, right? So there is no other force that is acting. Now, obviously normal reaction won't do any work because, um, because the normal reaction will be perpendicular to the velocity vector at all times. So. So its power is zero, um, hence it won't do any work. Okay. So it's a pretty basic fact. So the only force that will do work here is gravity. So, and the work done by gravity, we can write it in terms of the potential energy, right? So we can say the decrease in potential energy, which is just MGH plus the initial kinetic energy, which is half MV naught squared equals the final kinetic energy, which is half MV squared. So from here, we'll get V as this particular value. Okay. So this corresponds to option A. So now let's talk about option um, question 13, which is we have to find the value of theta. So we have determined V in terms of known quantities, right? So the net velocity vector, so I'm just drawing it in one single plane here. So the velocity vector V makes an angle of theta with the horizontal. Okay. So we need one more information. So we know, we know the value of V if we can get uh, the horizontal velocity or the vertical velocity. Uh, then we can find cos theta, right? Okay, so the second equation that we'll be getting is from angular momentum uh, conservation. But uh, here it is important which axis uh, we are choosing, okay? So we are going to be choosing the main axis of the cone or the symmetry axis, okay? Let's call it as a Z direction. So first let's discuss why is angular momentum conserved about this axis. So if you observe the torque of mg, you guys can confirm it. So if this is the vertical axis, if you do, if you do R cross MG, it will come into the plane, right? And similarly, if you do R cross MG, R cross N for the normal reaction, it will come out of the plane. So basically the torque of MG and N is either into the plane or out of the plane, but none of them is along the Z direction. Okay. So therefore we can say that the torque along the Z direction is zero the net external torque, I mean. So which means we can say LZ is conserved. Now, if there was friction here uh, in picture, then we wouldn't be able to conserve angular momentum because as you can imagine, friction would be either like into the plane or out of the plane here. So if you do R cross F here, it will be either along Z or minus Z here, right? So as there is no friction here, we can conserve angular momentum. So now let's do it. So all we have to do is, so now the so the initial angular momentum, if you see, it is M V naught R naught, right? Okay. And from the given diagram, it is going to be in the minus Z direction, but again, direction doesn't really matter here. So initial angular momentum magnitude would be M V naught R naught. And finally, now here we have to be careful. The final angular momentum is going to be M V cos theta times R, 
where uh, r is the radial distance from our axis okay so it wouldn't be v it wouldn't be m v r and uh, the reason for that is if uh, again what is angular momentum again so it is m r cross v right so you can write v you can break down v as v cos theta and v sin theta so once again if you do r cross v sin theta this will be into the plane right so this is not the component along the z direction the so lz will be contributed by the v cos theta term so that's the reason why i wrote v cos theta here so from here we'll get cos theta equals v not r not upon v multiplied by r now v is once again v not square plus 2 gh under root and we have to figure r right now for finding out r we can use uh, uh, you can use a triangle similarity stuff right so this distance is uh, given to be h this is r not this is r and this is given to be alpha so so if i draw another line over here this angle is also going to be alpha right so this green length over here this would be h so this would be h tan alpha right so r is nothing but r naught and subtracting h tan alpha from it right uh, because r is going to be equal to this length and this length would be r naught minus h tan alpha so now we can just substitute it over here so r would be r naught minus h tan alpha so that i guess corresponds to option a okay so now in option um, so so question 15 uh, says that what is the minimum value of v naught for which the particle will be moving in a horizontal circle of radius r naught okay so so basically um, in this question the particle does not move along the cone right we want it to so initially we projected it along this circle giving it a velocity of v naught so we we just want it to keep performing this circular motion and we don't want it to go down okay so so once again let's just draw the fbd here so the at some instant let's say the particle is over here and its velocity is into the plane okay so i'm basically drawing a side view of the situation so the forces acting on the particle once again is the normal reaction and gravity so clearly it has to be in equilibrium along the vertical so this angle is alpha so this angle would be alpha so so equation one is clearly n sine alpha should be equal to mg and uh, equation two is going to be n cos alpha which is the horizontal force in the horizontal plane right it should be providing the necessary centripetal acceleration right so n cos theta n cos alpha would be m v naught square divided by r this would be r naught and why is it r naught because the radius of the circle is r naught so now if so now all you have to do is divide these two equations so v naught square equals g r naught upon tan alpha so this is the velocity with which if you project it will keep moving in a circle so so that would be option c i guess so yeah that would be the discussion to this question now let's move on to the next one okay so the next question states that we so for the next question we have an arrangement uh, shown in which the rod is freely pivoted at point o so it's fixed at point o and it is and is in contact with the equilateral triangle which can move on the horizontal frictionless ground as a block is given a speed v forward the rod rotates above the point o find the angular velocity of the rod uh, at the instant when theta is 30 degrees okay so v is given uh, we have to find out the omega of this rod now this uh, question you can once again same process that we did for question two right you can um, move the triangle a little bit towards the right after dt seconds and observe how much the rod rotated the same process that we did for the second question uh, but yeah just for a change i'm going to use the calculus approach here okay so okay so this angle is theta now here if you observe uh, so now this equilateral triangle side length is 2a by root 3 okay and the altitude of the equilateral triangle is root 3 by 2 times the side length so the altitude is just going to be a so this length so now let's just say the x coordinate of the center of the triangle is x uh, then from here we can uh, write tan theta right so tan theta would be a divided by x okay so now we can just differentiate this expression so derivative of tan theta would be c square theta d theta by dt and uh, a is a constant x is a variable 
because the triangle is moving towards the right. So this would be minus a divided by x squared times tx by dt. Okay, so now the rate at which the x coordinate of the triangle is changing would be just the x velocity of the triangle, which is given to be v. So this would be equal to minus a by x squared times v. So yeah, that's about it. So from here, we can easily find out the omega of the rod minus a v divided by uh, x square sec square theta. And uh, x secant theta is nothing but the hypotenuse of this triangle. So you can also write it as a v divided by l squared. Okay, so now this angle theta is given to be 30 degrees, which means l would be just 2a. Okay, so the magnitude of omega turns out to be 5 radians per second after substituting all the values. Okay, so the next question is from fluid, fluid mechanics. So water is filled in a uniform container whose cross-sectional area is capital A. A hole of cross-sectional area A, which is negligible, which is uh, very small in comparison to capital A, is made in the container at a height of 20 meters above the base. Okay, so this, uh, there's a typo here, it would be 20 meters. Water streams out and hits a small block placed at some distance from the container. With what speed the block should be moved such that um, such that the water streams always hit the block. You know the fluid that uh, that is coming out of the hole. We want it to always fall on the block. Now we know that as the height of the water column starts decreasing, the the range uh, you could say of the fluid will start decreasing right so the fluid so basically the range of the fluid will keep on going down decreasing so we want to move the block in such a way that the fluid always hits the block so that's the question so that's what the question is asking uh, the first thing the velocity with which the fluid is emerging from the hole which is called the efflux velocity let's call it ve uh, it is going to be square root of 2g h uh, where h is the distance of the hole from the free surface okay we can write it because uh, so we are able to write this because of the assumption that a is small in comparison to capital a okay and uh, the derivation of this is with Bernoulli's theorem so once we know the efflux velocity the, after this we can you know solve it like normal projectile motion and the initial velocity here is horizontal so let's say the trajectory of the projectile is something like this so the time of flight of the projectile is going to be square root of 2 into 20 divided by g uh, as this height is 20 meters right so this is just two seconds we can see that the efflux velocity decreases with time because h is decreasing right so as the efflux velocity decreases the range of the projectile will keep decreasing but the time of flight is a constant okay so so let's say the range let's call the range of the projectile as just uh, x itself okay so x uh, would be nothing but the horizontal speed which is root 2gh multiplied by the time of flight which is 2 seconds okay so this would be 2 root 2gh okay so now basically we want to figure out how how is x changing with respect to time so so if i determine dx by dt so what dx by dt is the rate at which this x distance x is decreasing so so basically that should be the same velocity with which we should be moving the block as well. If the range is decreasing at a range of, let's say, at a rate of, let's say, 0.5 meters per second, then we need to move the block at 0.5 meter per second as well. So basically, dx by dt, which is the rate at which the range is decreasing, this should also be the velocity of the block. Then we can ensure that the fluid will always hit the block. Okay, so dx by dt. So now uh, we'll just have to differentiate this expression. So that will be... 2 root 2g and the square root of h would become 1 by 2 root h times the time derivative of h. Now in order to, so dh by dt, so that would be the rate at which the free surface of the water is dropping, right? So we'll have to use some mass conservation stuff here, right? So what's the logic that we're going to be using? Basically the amount of fluid that is leaving the hole is the same amount by which the fluid level decreases in the container. So, so we know that the volume flow rate, which is dV by dt of the fluid that is leaving the container is equal to the cross-sectional area times the efflux velocity. Okay, so this is basically our continuity equation, right? 
Okay, so we can kind of modify this a bit and write it as dv equals ave dt. So what this equation means is that in a time of dt, dv volume, which is this much of fluid leaves the container. Okay, so, so let's say as a result, the water level dropped by a distance of h. So this is the decrease. So this is the volume of the fluid that decreased. Okay, so this should also be equal to dv. Okay, so but this is just a small cylinder whose height is h and area of cross section is capital A. So I can also write it as a times okay, it won't be h, it will be dh, right? It's a small decrement in height. So it will be a times dh. So we can say a into dh uh, is the same as a v e into dt. So from here, the rate at which the height is decreasing would be small a divided by capital A times V E. Okay, so now let's go back to the dx by dt expression. So dx by dt was square root of 2g by h times small a by capital A into E flux velocity, which was square root of 2g h. So here the h just cancels out and we get small a upon capital A times 2g. Okay, so, so basically this small a by capital A was given to be 1 by 20, 2g is also 1 by 20. So dx by dt will be 1 meters per second. So, so what that means is the arrow of, uh, you can think of this like the arrow moving towards the left with 1 meter per second, which means the block which is catching the water should also move towards the left with 1 meter per second. So the answer to this question will be just uh, 1 meter per second. Okay. Okay. So that was it for this video, guys. If you enjoy the video, please do like, share and subscribe. And I'll be bringing more such videos in the future. Okay. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching.